she's knocking down like a factory chimney in a northern town. And I am demolished, I call her a mercury girl. She never sees me till the sun goes down, lives in the secret world, says her career. Welcome to Winterfest, the music and arts festival where we're banishing the winter blues. Proceeds from the festival go to the Winterfest Wellbeing Fund, supporting local people and Mid and Northeast Essex Mind. Featuring 22 events, check our website, brightlingseawinterfest.co.uk, for full details. And please make a donation via our PayPal link. Okay, uh, welcome everybody to this uh, Winterfest event featuring uh, Martin Newell, who's been a great friend of Brightling Sea Winterfest uh, over the years. Uh, I'm Mike Matheson, uh, as in the good old days, and I'm talking about last February uh, here. Um, I'm going to uh, kick off with um, some short things uh, to sort of warm up, as it were, as opposed to jumping up and down. And uh, Shortly after that, Martin will be coming with some, some of his poetry as well as stories and all round entertainment, I'm sure. Uh, and we'll be finishing uh, with a QA and a um, with Martin and you can send in questions via Facebook Live or YouTube uh, if you've got some questions to ask Martin. Uh, so that would be great if you could, if if you do that. Uh, and I'm going to start uh, with three short pieces uh, uh, as hors d'oeuvres, if you like. Uh, and here we go. The first one is celebration. Oh, blimey! Special effects. Uh, this one is um, a poem. Uh, it's it's about the world being a much better place for some reason. I suppose becoming a much better place. So here we go. It's called celebration. 
Uh, they'd be rocking in the co-op, singing in the post office, rappers reciting lullabies in playgroups, carnivals on motorways, ballet on traffic islands, gymnastics coached in care homes twice on Fridays. Tax notices will be typed in verse, street parties held in tower blocks, fireworks with silencers will be set off by cats and dogs. Every hearse will have a rainbow respray. Police officers will all wear yellow socks. Tanks will be made into fairground rides. The homeless move into Docklands. All differently abled and enabled to ride round velodromes. Accountants will credit imagination. There'll be opera in the street and the commonest greeting will be welcome home. Lovers will learn to tango, friends will dance northern soul, mere acquaintances will indulge in the hokey cokey, will be issued with shares in everything. It's Christmas, New Year, Diwali, Eid al Fitir. It's Ian Jury coming out of chokey. Shyness will be nurtured, like orchids, flamboyance enjoyed like a rose. All pleasure boats will be lifted by high tide. There'll be an Olympics of good arguments and a festival of facts. What's the cause for celebration? I'll let you decide. Okay, all right. Um, this one, um, okay. Um, uh, okay, sorry, I was just uh, finding things, negotiating screens here for a moment. But um, yeah, it, you don't need, to tell, need me to tell you it's a weird time, a very hard time, uh, I know, for some. Uh, but if you're like me, you've just been forced to stay uh, at home uh, and, you know, not go, not go out very much, a bit of sort of an existential Switzerland, really. Uh, not much happens, but uh, hey, you've got the mountains, you know. Uh, so in response to that, uh, I wrote this over the last month. It's called, So This Is How It Feels. So this is how it feels to be as slow as a raindrop, to welcome the bin men with a banner made of jiffy bags, to cheer on the woman who delivers a new spatula. So this is how it feels to design a gym for procrastination, to make detailed plans to repeat yourself, to pass time like a clocked milometer. So this is how it feels to put to sea knowing the earth is flat, to wait for the catch like a clumsy trapeze artist, to watch like a redundant war correspondent. Uh, so this is how it feels for a friend's face to be better screened than Bond, to love like the prodigal son, to see the Aladdin's cave of a snowdrop. So this is how it feels to wait for a blackbird, to feel the texture, not the width, to move like a pendulum hanging from the sun. OK, I'm going to move on to Martin in just a moment now. Uh, and uh, remember, after, as I say, after Martin's uh, performance, uh, you're going to be able to ask him some questions which you can send in via Facebook Live or YouTube. Uh, so that will be a possibility uh, to uh, do that as well. OK, so uh, this uh, last one of mine is called... Uh, that's what it's called, DNA, DNA. Uh, it's one that people may have heard before based on the idea that all life on earth is related, whether we like it or not, here we go. DNA, those in the know know we're 98% chimp or bonobo. Then again, we're 90% cat. Stretch and relax with that. And catch this on a stick I'm about to lob. We are 84% dog. Uh, not to mention 75% mouse. Um, awkward when they want to share the house. In fact, we're 69% platypus. Who'd have thought that of us? 
consider also what those little flying flecks imply. The buzz is we're 60 percent fruit fly. Alarming with this disarming charmer, we could be 50 percent banana. So welcome to the franchise of a wider fraternity. At least a quarter of us is tree. And nothing can be dismissed as inferior, seeing as we're at least 3% bacteria. By this reckoning, it's challenging but true. Whoever you are, I am 99.9% .9 you. Okay, that's me. Uh, that's me and the introductions over and I'll be quiet in a second and hang over to, hand over to Martin. Uh, I've been looking forward to it. Uh, he's written some very fine uh, poetry that I've enjoyed very much. Uh, some haunting and evocative uh, stories. Uh, and so without further ado, or I don't, I'll be handing over, here he is, internationally quite well known, pensioner star and legend in his own livestock, Mr. Martin Ewell. Is that better? Thank you. <laughs> yes, Mr. Professional, <laughs> now you can hear me, okay? Tell me you can. Give me a signal, somebody. Right. Yes, you're going to get a few dog stories today, um, probably. We had a case of my, uh, dog in, in our family, and um, we had to get it to the vet because it had a, an ingrowing tail. And I said, an ingrowing toenail? And the vet said, no, it's an ingrowing tail. I went, right, so so what next? He says, well, we've, we've got to get it x-rayed. And I, I said, why? And he said, we've got to find out whether it's happy or not, you know? So with that, I should do this poem, uh, which I wrote for my granddaughter, actually. That's how old I am now. It's about the most bitten bottom in Britain. So it's a kid's program, really, and it's, it, it is fit to listen to. I feel like Trevor McDonald's here. I put my glasses on, shall I? And after the break, why Hoppy the Hippo won't be going home for Christmas. Miss Chardonnay, Gloria Lytton, had the most bitten bottom in Britain. Creatures would view it and queue up to chew it, from tiger to tiniest kitten. The dogs in the town of Thames Ditton, upon catching sight of Miss Lytton, would claw at the doors and start clacking their jaws at the most bit and bottom in Britain. Now, little Miss Lytton, we find, was pretty near out of her mind. Till shaking her fist, she recited a list of the things that might bite her behind. I've been pecked by an eagle, nipped by a beagle, stung by a mozzie which got in my cosy, then after a ghastly attack by a wasp, it all ended up in me being taken to hospital. Don't even talk about going to a zoo. Much as I'd love to, what would I do? A bottom's for sitting while sewing or knitting. You must forgive me for stopping right here, but changing the subject. Only last year, I was chased through the park when I walked home at dark by a couple of badgers, a fox and some deer all of them trying to snap at my rear. And frankly, my dear, I am awfully bored being bitten and pecked at and, and nibbled and gnawed. But the least I can do, since you're begging me to, is to gratefully, gracefully take this award. I'm proud in a way, said the lovely Miss Lytton, in spite of the pain of being constantly bitten, to win is so stunning. And 14 years running, awarded the most bitten bottom in Britain. I've got a... This is being run from Brightling Sea, this, this gig. It's called the Brightling Sea Winterfest. And the reason it was started was because a lot of people get down in the English winter. I mean, it's not just cold like a Swiss or German winter. But I think it's a bit like a Belgian. I think the Belgians have this as well. But you can, you can get quite down, really. And um, sometimes people do so it was it was decided a really good time when people have really had enough by about halfway through february when it's been lashing you since november uh that, that they would have this thing to to cheer people up and that's what they've done now last year when the uh, i hate to use these words lockdown because the news people at the beeb love it don't they, they love using these dramatic sort of military words lockdown 
lockdown roadmap. I hate all that. I, I think I should call it things like Angela or or Kitten or something like that. It'd be pretty much nicer, wouldn't it, really? Uh, so I wrote this poem in the spring. Like this spring we had last year was in the contrast of the dreadful news we had, really virgent and elevating, you know? It was actually very nice and people couldn't go to work, so they were forced, a lot of them Londoners who've moved here, to go out walking or cycling, which they put special clothes on for rather than just putting some suede boots on or something. But never mind, they're showing the right response. Stay out of your cars, go for a walk. And I wrote this poem about all the things that weren't bad. So I called this In Other News. And it got shared many hundreds of times, which I was very moved by. And uh, the BBC actually rang me up on a couple of occasions. Not the Nationals, of course, because I always ask them for money. In other news, across those fields, a tractor combs the furrows now. The seagulls trail behind the plough and rooks will referee. But further out and further still, the word in the regretful breeze is that the townsman rarely sees the greening of those trees. In other news, in other news. The sulking sun emerged today from chiffon cloud, forgave, forgot, then beaming down, turned every furrow lighter brown, until the birds emboldened here by lack of traffic in the lanes and absence now of aeroplanes, far from fearing something wrong, began to fill the sky with song. In other news, in other news, the shoppers in their cautious queues began exchanging pleasantries, Pleases, thanks, and after use. In other news, the lark ascends, declaims the Ides and the Calends. As March, the noisy tenant goes, a breezy blackthorn blossom snows across the woodland paths. On country roads, the ghosts of cars glide soundless after countless years, till silence settles on the ears, like months of Sundays in arrears. In other news, a chilly night, the frost upon the rooftops light on weekday mornings, strangely calm. A dog barks on a distant, on a distant farm, excuse me, answering the lambs and ewes. In other news, in other news, in other news, the morning bus will judder into town unfilled where bees awake and blackbirds build in copper beach and churchyard ewes. Now lich gates yawn and railings rust. The tiny specks of sunlit dust are all that occupy the pews. In other news, in other news, through leafy squares down Market Street, a single pair of shopper's feet goes tapping past a covered stall. And all along the Roman wall, the stone recalls how echoes fall of earlier times and other cues. In other news, in other news. I thank you. I can't hear you. Um, a couple of years ago, someone from another distant land had the temerity to say that our native English women were badly dressed and not great looking. And so immediately the editor of the national newspaper for which I wrote poems weekly said, can you do something about this, Martin? And I said, yes. <laughs> Give me a gun. No, I, I said, I shall write a poem, shall I? I'm better at that. So I wrote this, Our Native Rose. And not only that, a native rose of a certain age. A woman of a certain age, as British in her looks, as brollies in a hallway. A pile of gardening books, a dog lead on a banister, a crossword on a chair, a Kirby grip or headscarf to hold her honey hair, a modicum of makeup, her unpretentious air. She'll be aware of fashion, though possibly won't care, and looks as good off duty when standing with a chap as presidential beauty done up in full slap. But don't you think she's lovely? In autumn after rain, walking in a westerly along some rural lane, a battered waxy jacket, 
Chelsea boots and jeans, better than a dozen of your bony catwalk queens, for a pale rose complexion and a seascape in her eyes, for the landscape of a figure, whatever shape or size, for the humour in expression and the cadence of her voice, you wouldn't take a minute if you had to make a choice. There you are. That's my, <laughs> that's my gift to womankind, unlike Ian Jury's, which is, I think, probably a bit more corporeal. Good word, that. I wonder what it means. This was to HP Source. I've got a thing. I'm getting a thing about how the middle classes have, are making loads and loads of food programmes. And there's loads of food banks and they're making, this is the BBC, right? The London BBC Metro, they're making loads of food pro programmes and there's food banks. What's wrong with this picture? We need more of this <laughs> and, and we want to stop wittering on about pink salt and have some proper white stuff that does you proper harm on chips. White pepper. I'll tell you what, pepper is being used as a battle, part of the battle. This is, I, I couldn't figure out how to get anything out of this for years till someone told me you give it a twist. But the one I, the one I got that my, my cherished partner gave me is this is the one that they bring around in continental restaurants. <laughs> Just when you're getting on well with the chick, some handsome Italian or Spanish waiter comes around and says, ah, would you like, would you like some, some stuff? And you're thinking, oh. <laughs> So in the end, I got one so I could do it back. Yes. <laughs> and this is the way I go on until I'm remedicated usually. So now a poem to HP Source. A source of pleasure and of salt, of vinegar, of dates, of malt, of sugar, spices, tamarinds brought in by ships on temperate winds of warmer climates where they'd grown than any British ports had known, then cooked into a spicy brew, this sauce, this elixir, this goo, decanted, set upon the table, fluted bottle, pale blue label, poured on steaks and watery spuds to cut through cold clogged smoke fugged buds in foggy weeks, on smoggy days in roadside restaurants and cafes and placed on pacalada shells by order of the lords themselves for chips and chops, the last anointment. Naturally, it's by appointment. Commoner and king endorse the zing. Arise, Sir H.P. Sauce. That's not, that's not product placement and nor is it advertising. It used to be made in Aston, Birmingham, you know, and um, now it's made in Holland, I think. Well, yes, we're making, <laughs> we're also making HP sauce. Uh, people have been so kind. This is what the toffs say when they've been caught out. People have been so kind. I do that sometimes when, when someone sort of comes up to you and goes, oh, hello, how are you? Like that, and you go, oh, you know, I'm all right. But it's better if you stand and look, gaze into the middle distance like this, place your hand solemnly on your, on your chest and say, people have been so kind. It baffles them. And so this is the litany of things that you hear the toffs say when they've been caught out. People have been so kind. I am slowly regaining my former strength with the aid of a nourishing broth administered to me by Edith, my nurse, who alights late at night like a moth. Having been ill for a number of months, payments have fallen behind. I shall make all amends when I'm better. People have been so kind. But in the boxed set of the public mind, like a crime series set in the north, dog-faced detectives confer in the hall. Pathologists slip back and forth, sifting through carbonized folders. Even more evidence smolders. Nowadays, there's little forensics won't find. People have been so kind, so kind. I stood on the steps of the county court as weak as a beaten horse. The click of the cameras, ticking of text, like media gossip in Morse. I intend while in prison to busy myself, 
knitting warm pants for the blind. My wife has declared she'll stand by me. People have been so kind. I have written some poetry while on remand. I have helped fellow inmates to read. I'm studying Leviticus, Paul and Isaiah. My faith is now all that I need. Let the girl from Belgravia claim there's a mole. Let a doctor inspect my behind. I will rebuild my life. I am pure in my soul. People have been so kind. Yes, I hope you like that. I don't often do that one. I, do, I decided I'd do some um, stuff which I, which I haven't done before. Because um, not enough poems, uh, not, not enough poets take on... Um, well, take on ordinary subjects, really. And, and they should do, because that's what people like. And, you know, poetry, as I think, you know, Mike Matheson, who preceded me there and did in the previous three years, he, he, he does ordinary stuff as well, don't you? And, then, and that's what it needs. It doesn't need high-flown metaphysical things. I think academia has executed a very graceless hijack of poetry and held it out of the reach of people, like old dogs over an old bone that's long buried in the grounds and not let anyone near it and, and I want to bring it back into that domain so here's a poem about the Royal Air Force which I found out about because I interviewed an old Spitfire pilot for you know shortly before he died one of the last ones he, he lived in Thorrington not far from here and he was a very small man because actually um, the Spitfire's cockpit could more have been designed for women it was it, it fitted a, a small and slender body um apparently and they trained these 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 very very young men they were 18 17 18 19 20 these were the spitfire pilots they trained in hawker hearts and hinds the striplings who would save our land then barely out of school they flew high into that breathless blue a daily quick step done with death, yet safely home to earth again, biked back across the counterpane of fields and commons laced by lane, and having seen it from the air, smoked for England with the strain. But when these boys were only born, there'd been an earlier bundle fought, where knights with fragile steeds of struts and fabric duelled in France, in other pardieurs, where other Icaruses took their chance, and whether won or whether lost, had never paused to learn the costs, since youth and bravery are deaf. With that began the RAF. Now those three letters still precede far older Norse and Saxon names of ancient hamlets little known, places from which planes were flown, Lossiemouth and Honington, Tangmere, Darley Moor, Hornchurch, Cranwell, Northolt, Coningsby, Duxford, Cosford, Benson, Birch, Binbrook, Scampton, Cottesmore, called and now recalled by war. Perhaps another hundred years could see a base on Mars per adua, per adua ad astra through hardship to the stars. As they do, gaze up into that breathless blue to marvel what went through their minds who trained in Hawker Hearts and Hinds. There you go. Should do a, should do another tour. I, I was um I ha I haven't been on a plane for about oh, I think fourteen years, something like that. Two thousand eight. How long ago is that? That's the last time I was on a plane. I came back because you very often I don't know the, the air in these these planes isn't very good. And I came back. I was in the doctor's. He was astonished, you know, because I've got this, you know, really. Yeah, you know, I was going on about Englishmen, but I just really great looking. A French woman sitting on my knee, and I said, "I, I don't know what's happened, right? But I feel pretty dreadful." And she said, "Yeah, you've um, you've picked up something on holiday." <laughs> Sorry, so I get back to this poetry business. Uh, one thing about me is I partly, after that thing with ancestry DNA, as well as finding a lot of Viking and Norfolk in me, uh, there's a little bit of Native American, which is explains Apache complexion, and. I was rubbing away at this, right? So this interface with food that the middle classes have introduced, you know, where you get something that's actually food and use it on your face or, or, or vice versa. And so I'm scrubbing away with this brand scrub. I think it's called a defoliant. No, that's Agent Orange. No, it's an exfoliant, yeah. And um, 
Anyway, the top layer of skin comes off, and underneath it, this amazing, ornate brickwork, which we think was probably Victorian. It's one of those kind of type uh, stories, isn't it, really? Look, I'll find you a Vicar recruitment wrap. That's quite good. I do wrap the, the, the church a few years ago were having troubles attracting new Vicar recruits. I don't know what you call a Vicar recruit. There is a name for it, isn't there? Um, it's not like an undergrad, but it's something like that. And, I, and you, you're not, you can't tell me, so and it's going to be too late if it comes up on the screen there. So I'll just do the rap, shall I? And you'll have to imagine the beatbox, because I've not switched one on. C of E, it's the one for me. We're talking three, featuring Trini T. Your mobile soul phone comes for free. It's a friends and family, too. Big G. Give me a V, now give me an I, and a C A R to the other side. Heaven's Gate, it's a park and ride. Who'd you call when your granny's died? Vicar, say that name with pride. Service time on the bells go clang. It's a happening, a clapping kind of thing. From a warm up prayer in the vestibule to a chilled out church, an ambient yule. Snow, be deep, the wind, be cruel. Smell of faith is a cool cagoule. Yeah, I give it up, I give it up. This for vespers, eye for an eye. The sermon's hot, but the ink ain't dry for those in peril on the sea. You who would a pilgrim be no R and R on the Sabbath day. Can the dude deliver? Believe it. Yes, way. More e vicar? Not for me. Except ecclesiastically. When the work comes in, gotta make that call. Yo, Corinthians, quit it, Paul. PP Father, Son and Ghost. The devil's ill in, but he's toast. Ow. Was that all right, Em, was it? I don't know how we're doing for time here. Ooh. Blimey, three o'clock already. I've been going like a good in here. So I think I should ease up because we're doing a we're doing a QA shortly, aren't we? I think. So what I should do is see if I can find you this uh yeah, I think I have this here somewhere. Someone's upset it. No, I can't possibly do that. I'm not going to do this. Yeah, it's just, it's a bit of a sad story because again, it it takes in um, takes in depression. But it was a chap who'd who'd gone to the Lake District, and he was staying there, and he was staying at a place called uh, well, the, the, the Cumbrians pronounce it Threckled, but it's Threlkeld. It's not far from Keswick. It's a place called Brundon Woods there, and um, he. Was staying there. He said, you know, as the Cumbrian B&B &B people do, in fact, all B&B &B people do, say, uh, you got any special dietary needs for your breakfast? And he said, yeah, I'm, um, I don't eat meat or really, I'm not exactly a vegan, but uh, he said, well, what are you trying to get at here? What, what would you like for your breakfast? He said, well, baked beans, just um, baked beans. He said, just baked beans in a bowl, that'd be, be fine. In the morning. He comes down for breakfast and the, the landlord's there with a big saucepan of beans and he gives him a bowl of beans and the guy says, this isn't going where you think it's going, by the way. He gives him the bowl of beans, he, he eats the beans and the landlord comes out. He says, everything all right for yourself, is it? They do do so that now, don't they? He says, everything all right for yourselves at all, is it? Can I get you any more coffee with that at all for yourself? But he didn't say that because he was a Cumbrian, they don't speak like that. He said, um, yeah, I could go, go another half a bowl of beans if you like. So... The hiker has another half a bowl of beans and he packs up his kit. He pays his bill. He says, very nice. Thank you very much. Very considerate. And he goes. About 36 hours later, the landlord of the B&B &B is just kind of doing the kind of thing that landlords and B&Bs do when you're all out. I don't know what it is, but it's probably fairly something, something fairly innocuous, I would have hoped. So anyway, not involving ladders or gym equipment or anything like that. I've never seen any anyway. Anyway, he's, he's, there's a knock on the door. There's the police. They say, they hold up a picture of a hiker. He said, have you had this guy staying here? And the landlord says, yeah. He says, was there um, anything unusual about it? He says, no, no, he's a bit quiet. He's um, he, he was very ordinary, really, in all other respects. He was, he was going over Brundle on Woods. He said, yeah, we've um, we've uh, we found his uh, his bodies, you know, he's... Um, it was it was okay, but he, he he you know he'd had a you know he's, we'll get him back, but he's um, yeah apparently he's 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 very very depressed, and uh, the landlord says uh, it's funny he was full of beans when he left. <laughs> 
do you, do you want to take this over to your Q and A now before I die of something? Hey, is anybody out there? Yes, I'm here. Good. Would you like some more, you slags? <laughs> Whatever you you fancy. I now, mean, what have we got here? Do you want to ask? Do you want? Do you want a, a, a question or two, and you can do something else as well in between if you like. I probably can. Yes. I mean, I, I was actually just I just was going to ask you whether. What, was that all right? There was it. Yeah, brilliant. Oh, good, brilliant. good, good. Yeah, I should give you a. I, I should say thank I you try, very much, no, Martin. I'll it's just you. I'm trying not to try not to use any naughty words, anything that rhymes with trucks. Um, that was truck, great. Or, or, or tanker. I love the bit bottoms. That. I love the yes. bit bottoms. It's a children's poem, yeah. It, and um, I was laughing all the way through, so <laughs> I enjoyed yes, it. Kids, well, me, me and a guy called um, who you probably some of you will know as Howling Wilf. Yes, or, or um, James Hunter. Now he's a famous R and B singer, yeah. and he's also very good um, illustrator. And he and I are old friends, and we plan to do a book of children's poetry with illustrations together. And his illustrations are really super. They're a little bit like um, oh Edward Ardizzoni sort of style, but they're a thing of their own. They're a bit funkier than that, a bit like Rolling Stones yeah, to Beatles yeah. sort Excellent. of funky. Yeah. So and I'm going to take up missing pants for the blind as well. For, that. <laughs> for some yes. reason, I found that an amusing. Yeah. Well, knitting socks for the knitting socks for the vulnerable. Yes. Collecting for the vulnerable. That's another one. It's I, was gonna, I was going to ask you. I mean, has it been? Uh, has the last year been? Uh, you know, a good one for work with you, or has it been a more difficult one? It, for, I think, like for most people, it's been for work. It's been good because there have been. Uh, fewer interruptions mm. and I have just I just record and write in, incessantly I'm always writing or recording it's probably been bad in as much as I haven't been able to take a break from it um, I've sometimes f found myself actually exhausted and uh, and get, getting in a, a bit getting a bit strange like people do just work all the time and I've had to make myself go out and do a big long cycle ride or what because I never go to gyms or sure. anything like that. not even if they were open you know, it's just not the sort of thing I do. I don't own any sporting clothes. I mean, I would dress like this to go cycling or go up the co-op because <laughs> it cracks the whips and it shows that men, English men, aren't making enough of an effort to sort of dress up like tarts, really. <laughs> it's just, you know, I was a glam rocker, so. Yeah, no, that was great. No, no, it, uh, it's good. And, and you, as you say, I think the, the, the sort of outdoors helps as well sometimes. It, it? it really, really does, yeah. I spent a lot of time outdoors and... But I... And I also, I could do a bit of gardening because I don't have a garden here. I live in a sort of turreted tower, but um, I, yeah. I really like garden. That's very good for me. And a couple of times when things really got me down, I just appeared in this person's garden. I mean, she, she was out shopping and and, <laughs> and I was pruning and because I said I would do and I was pruning and she said, something must have really upset you. You know, I said it had actually. <laughs> I, that, actually, I was thinking I'm going bonkers. And so I went and just hurled myself into my old job, which was gardening. Excellent, excellent. I'll tell you what, I've got a fascinating question here that I've got to ask you from Peter Verbeest. He says, um, he noticed at the beginning of Clara Bow, there's a sound of a duck. And I saw a picture of you holding a duck on your Instagram sometime yeah. ago. Is it the um, same duck? And why are ducks the most wonderful creatures? Well, um, that duck was part of the, um, he was called Arthur, that duck that I was holding. He was a drake and he was the first one, but you can't just have one duck or one or, or a drake and you can't, and when you've got a duck, you can't just have a duck and a drake because they're fairly libidinous creatures, drakes. Mm -hmm. um, and they will, you know, pester one duck. So you've got to have at least two females and they will serve, serve anything up to six or seven. So, uh, we soon collected some more ducks. They were khaki Campbell crosses. Uh, well, khaki Campbells are a cross. I'm trying to remember. They're a cross between an Indian runner and a and an Aylesbury. They're a sort. Of, they're one of the first super ducks. They can lay a lot of eggs. And and the, but it, but the drakes don't make the noise. The ducks do. The ducks kind of go whack whack whack. A drake kind of makes a kind of sort of noise, sort of noise. But the, but the ducks are the ones that make the the big noise. Yeah. Oh, excellent. So they were, yeah, they were, they, and they were, that was, uh, I think the two the females, period, as it were, there were fem females with um, Amelia and oh, I can't remember what they're called, Daphne and Amelia, the first ones. Excellent. And, yeah. 
So I remember their names, and it's 30 something years ago. I was still in my 30s. They were special. Yeah, well, ducks are great. I, I'm not so fond of chickens, you know. Chickens are quite mean to each other. Ducks are a bit different, you know. Yeah. Uh, okay, I've got, um, I asked, uh, I've got Rhett has asked, have you got any new music, you know, coming out? Tons of it. Yeah. I've been, I've been working overtime. I've got, as soon as we can, there's a film out next, and I think that comes out in April, and it's called The Jangling Man. It's a documentary. And then there's another film of a concert I did in 2003 for my 50th birthday, uh, or around about the time of my 50th birthday. I did this concert, and and, and that was at the Art Centre, and that was shot by Michael Cummings, who's done all the Michael Cummings, sorry, who who did all uh, Toast of London and mm. and and Brass Eye and things like that. He's oh. and he, but the new film is James James Sharp, and Graham Bendel did the one that. We had a premiere in London. I mean, suddenly, you, I don't know, you wait for all your life for a film, then sort of three or four come along at once. Mm. So when the films come out, then the music comes out and they re-release Rex, they re-release in the Off-White album on the 26th of March ah. as vinyl. That's Captured Tracks in America. Uh, and I want to, I've got a new album ready to, well, we've got tons of songs. I mean, it's going to be a really good album. Don't know what we're going to call it, but... I've got the answer, short answer is yes, I have loads of new music and it's coming to the end of that cycle. Now I'm just going to, like in a game of bar billiards, the bar comes down, the balls don't come back. Then I've got to tidy up what I've got and finish the match. And that's how I look at the album. Wow, excellent. That covers Steve Long's question. Well, he was asking about the Off-White album, but I've also got one uh, from John Wood who says, who was Wesley in Dear Wesley? Me. Ah, my middle name is Wesley. Ah, just getting some water here. It's right. It's not. It's not neat, Jen. <laughs> ah, well, that's a good. Uh, yeah, was, it was kind good. of me, but I, I, I write reality soup. You know, I put a little bit from this part of my life, or a little bit from that somebody else's life, and I make the stories out of that. And I, I do tend to write s stories more. And the more I get older, the more each song has become a little little kind of story in itself. See if I can pack it all into th three minutes. And so I've actually just written a song, which I couldn't think of, a called, called Sixpenny Novel. Hmm. It's got uh, a happy ending, though. Uh, excellent. <laughs> I, I like many of my old experiences. <laughs> While wandering the lonely back streets of Huddersfield. <laughs> Oh, I've got, well, I've got here, Amy, Amy Rosa has asked, uh, any news on the progress of the cleaners' songbooks? Yeah, um, actually, the guy who's doing the annotation for that, or the, and all the arrangements, they're arranged for guitars, because the guitar is by far the most used instrument in my composition, but... Um, he's called Daryl, but Daryl is... And Daryl is the guy for the job. But round about the time... <laughs> I gave him the commission to do this. He, he took up a PGCE. And that is, as my partner would say, is a very, very demanding thing to do. It's, it's where they train you, as far as I can ascertain, to, to take your academic knowledge of, say, music or whatever, and to pass it on to other people. In, all, in other words, it's teacher training of a sort. And it is very rigorous and very exacting. And so since there was no rush for this thing, I just said, right, well, just take a break, do the PGCE, it'll wait, you know. Mm. He's got all the songs, and occasionally we'd have a, we'll have a meeting, and I'll show him what my peculiar chord shapes are and what my tunings are to make the job easy for him. Because mm. I am a musical illiterate. Mm. I can punch above my waist as a composer, but I couldn't, I, I wouldn't know how that, in um, proper jazz musicians call that notation, they call it the fly ship. Mm -hmm. They say, oh, yeah, he's a professor, he can read the fly ship. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, excellent! No, that sounds that sounds great as well. I didn't know that was in the offing. So um... yes, yeah, so, and it's going to be lovely. It's going to be it's going to be a very beautiful book. It's going to be twenty five of the best known cleaners from Venus songs from the past forty years, yeah. with with the notes and a little story and possibly a little ir a little ir irritation, a little illustration. <laughs> a little illustration. Yeah. Yeah. No, a little illustration of, of me in a in a in a, in a 
candid polls. <laughs> so, so David Henderson, I mean, you've got some great questions here. David Henderson, who is the greatest living English woman? Wow. Oh, I could probably have, I could probably give you a number of answers for that. I think I think Joanna Lumley's pretty impressive. Mm. But uh, I think so is uh, what's her name from M People, you know, Heather Heather mm. Smalls. Yes. She's pretty amazing. Mm. She does a, a lot of stuff. Um I Kate normally Bush. About Kate that? Bush is pretty good. I would, it's not just the musicians, it's when you find there are they have other talents and other strengths. Mm. Uh you know, you very often do find that out in women more than more than certain other of the sexes. <laughs> which there are, Except awkwardly. <laughs> which there are many, yes. Can't make yeah. up your mind this year. Come to Wivenhoe. Yes. I tell you, Wivenhoe is, um, is an interesting place because we don't get burglars anymore now. You just get people break in and criticise your curtains or your book collection now. <laughs> Oh, oh, yeah. oh, oh, oh Angie Reid says she especially loved the bottom, the vicar, and the brickwork under your skin. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, there you go. Feedback. Hot off the press. Yeah. Good. Good. And Paul Wilkinson, was, yeah. you've got requests. How about yeah. requests? Well, Roy Christmas says, do the eyeball joke. I mean, I don't think I know the eyeball joke. Um, I don't know if I could do it to a a, a mixed... Um, no, fair enough. I, I Because there might be children or people... what Children yeah. or people like that. I, I, it's a bit, it's, it can be a bit rude. Fair play. We'll draw a veil over the eyeball. That one, I'm ch- I mean, normally in my old rock and roll days, I would have said, rrr, 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 yeah. I don't care, I'm not, I'm not sticking to anybody's rules. But I've come to realise in my anecdotage that it's probably best to entertain people rather than upset you know? uh, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and someone is hoping to hear computer dating. Uh, oh, hang on, that's a song, is it? Yes. Yes, but it's bloody ancient. That uh, Most people, go. that's that was... Uh, sort of 1974 and it was plod and I don't know who the person how the person would know that no. Who's, who has sent that that oh hold on uh, it is, uh, James Diggins wow oh yeah yeah he would know he would know from that so I didn't even know I didn't even know um, James knew the, knew the song but it was it was a, a, a kind of a breakthrough it was where I'd because I was in this glam rock band and suddenly I, I learned um, minor seventh chords and started listening to Steely wow. Dan and things like that and, and French chansonniers and it showed in my songwriting that it didn't all have to be boogie. You know what I noticed looking at your Facebook the other day, uh, you mentioned the fact that you've lost some songs and it occurs to you, oh, I remember this song, but I've lost it somewhere. I mean, is that is um, that rich? <laughs> I do sometimes um, lose songs, hmm. uh, but, but only in their in their infancy. Yeah. You know where I put stuck them, banged them down on a, on a bit of old tape somewhere, hmm. and and I do and I generally think if they're any good, they'll come back. They usually do, but sometimes I find old. There's a drawer here with mi- little tiny mini cassettes in, and they've got ideas on there. I mean, if I never wrote a song again, if I never had another idea, I have enough tapes and things to, you know, just trigger something or other. Probably. Mm. But I, I always like the new. I, I like I love the idea of the new, the idea that you woke up with and suddenly by the afternoon it's shaping up. And then by the end of the week, you've got something you can actually stick on a record. Uh, I think the Beatles and I were well, generally in the 1960s mid 60s which i adored because I, I was a young teenager and and a kid still then people had to write and do things much quicker mm. and so the beatles would be writing on the road and, and i think when you got an album that they'd written and then recorded two weeks later and they were re- writing and recording they were unintentionally taking a snapshot of a very fast moving time and they somehow i hate to use this expression but the germans have words that we don't have words for so uh, zeitgeist they capture the spirit of the age they capture whatever it was they bottle it and i think that happened with the film a hard day's night you watch a hard day's night now and it's still impossibly stylish very rushed you know full of enthusiasm and go and you think wow that's probably 
that that's probably a kind of snapshot of what it was. Yeah. No, yeah even though it was fictional. Help. Much better than the second film. Yes, it is. Yeah, it is better than Help. I mean, I've got an affection for Help, I suppose, but Help kind of drags in places, but Hard Day's Night never does. Mm. And I've yeah, watched it loads of times. That. And so when the Beatles were writing things, it, it was like they captured. So you you were constantly running to catch up with them, and you got yeah. to Rubber Soul. I was Rubber Soul. I was I think twelve or thirteen when that came out. And I just thought, wow. And I still listen to it now and think that you know I think. Yeah. I think it was more of a, a quantum leap that and revolver than 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 Sergeant Peppers was. Sergeant Peppers was a kind of conclusion of all that, but uh, and so but I I didn't think well, I'd want to do what the Beatles did, but to look for what they were looking for, you know, right. because they got something where they were actually they were futurists. People say, oh, the Beatles, that was a good old days. That was when it was proper music. But they used everything at their disposal. They even had a Moog yeah. synthesizer, I think. It was on Abbey Road. And harmoniums played backwards and this sort of thing. Yeah, that? yeah, yeah. Yeah, and so it was very exciting. You didn't know what was coming next. And so I, I try to apply that value, at least, to myself, where I think, I don't know what's coming next, but we're going to try and do this. And, and let's not do the, what you'd normally expect. Let's put something in there that... You know, that's what I try and do. So, so that each song I do is a little, little story with a, 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 a whole story in itself. It's self-contained. Oh, that's what I try and do. That's the only thing I've taken from the sixties. The rest of it is me. It's. I don't mean that. No, that, that that's fascinating. Well, thank you. I mean, the um, actually, I've got an interesting question following on from that. Really, about from Jakob van He, who who asks, um, "I'm making music myself, and I wonder." How or when do you decide if a song is ready? Oh, that's a great question. Man. Oh, um, well, there's a saying. There's a saying about poems. It wasn't me who said it. it was, that poems aren't finished; they're abandoned. But I think um, a lot of people, especially producers with a capital P, mm. go past the thing where they keep adding stuff. I think it takes a special discipline, which I'm still learning myself, to just say. Leave it, leave it there, leave it. And sometimes the, the punters all right and say, why didn't you finish that? Why, you know, mm. you just left a drum beat and a bass and, you know, one that weird piano on it. Like, yeah, because that's when it sounded good. And I, the amount of times over the past 40 years when I have been, I think women know this better than blokes. Mm. I said, you know, you've spent three days making this thing sound, wow. Mm. And they come by and say, oh, I preferred it when you just had the guitar and that bass on it and that little drum machine. You think, well, mm. you know, why do I bother? And then, but I've had so many people do that to me. I just think, mm. why don't I just leave it? Just mm. leave it all unfinished. Like, you know, when you see, um, I compare some of my music to, you know, when you see Vivian Westwood's stuff on the catwalk and she's on the runway and you see all threads dangling down or a bit that's just only been partly pinned up or something, hung on some, you know, clothes horse of a, of a woman. And you think, actually, once you've got the gag, that looks pretty good. So I try and do that with my song. If there's a few threads hanging down, it doesn't matter. The song's there. There it is in all its beauty. So leave the threads hanging down and, you know, and only one shoe on or something. So that's that's how I do things. It's, it's yeah. Okay, thank you. I mean, I've, uh, sorry, Russ Cotty's also asked here, an interesting one. Uh, could you ask Martin, was Miss Van Alton's coffee shop based on a Joe Lyons tea house by any chance? <sighs> no, it wasn't, actually. <laughs> it, was, it was kind of based on... Um, uh, when I was about 14 or 15, you couldn't go to pubs and I hung around with some these kids in Harpingdon. I, I was already beginning, I was already, I, I'd started work in London when I was young and I'd come down and meet these kids and they'd all go to cafes. I, I don't know if you're old enough to remember, people used to go to cafes. Yeah, yeah. Pubs were full of horrible men who, you know, looked at you with long hair and, and you couldn't get into pubs anyway. So, um, We'd go to cafes and there, sometimes, yeah, there'd be a, a waitress who'd be possibly much older than you at 19 or 20 when you were only 14. <laughs> Walking around, you'd be sort of thinking, oh, wow, I really love her. You know, <laughs> just that teenage crust time. So was, Miss, Miss Van Houten's coffee shop was that. 
and it's nothing to do with dope. It's just about a, an innocent, <laughs> an innocent, or, or Holland or anything. It's just an innocent young man sitting in a, you know, one of the many coffee shops that used to be in a, a, a small, you know, town in Hertfordshire where I partly grew up. Oh, okay. Now, thank you. Actually, there's one as a sort of technical one, which I think if someone asked, it'd be nice to help them with. Uh, it is um, about the song April Moon. Um, wow. And that is Jarrah Jones and asking, do you happen to recall the tuning you use when recording it? I mean, um, I crack at learning it myself, but can't quite get it rolling. You know what? I, I don't, don't blame if it goes wrong, but that could well be in the same tuning as Jangling Man. And right. I think I think it might be um, a, a, a D6. And, right. and that's just an ordinary, that's E, A, D, G. And then you bring the third string up to, uh, God, I've got to do it, G. So it goes up a tone to A. And the first string up to, um, let me see, it, it's an E. So it would go up a tone to, oh, I, I can't, I'm, I'm having trouble, G flat. Right. Yeah, so the, the first string would go up to G flat. And the third string would go up to A. And that that would make the whole guitar be a D6 chord. And I'm pretty sure that's what it was. That's certainly so if you can't find that there, what you will find there is Jangly Man and Blue Swan. They're yeah. both in D6. Yeah, no. <laughs> Interesting. Because that's what we also had. in a minute, actually, I was gonna suggest maybe do you think um do you fancy finishing off in a moment with with another piece, you know, a performance piece sort of thing? But uh, yeah, I can. Can yeah, yeah. kind of ask before that, but um, yeah. if that sounds good, I mean, I've got here. Um, uh, can someone said you can you tell us any more about the Jangling Man series and what to expect? It's, just, it's also their favourite song. That was Tom Richer. The, what about what Jangling it, Man itself? Yeah, song. and what to expect? He says, and the writing of it. You mean? Oh, the um, film. He means the film. Um, the right. Movie. Okay. Yeah. Well, they've James uh, Sharp, who's made it, has been very persistent. Mm. And he's just kind of had my address book. He's got some quite and he's and he's had people, famous people that I don't know that he's interviewed and people who I'd kind of were way back in my past that I'd lost touch with. He'd got in touch with them to talk about me. Not only that, but there were people he's in, I mean, he's, he's left no turn on stone sort of thing, you know, <laughs> and, and, and so there'll be lots of interview stuff, but he's also found some old footage of me actually 1987 with an May Fair and TV appearances. I did lots and lots of TV. I didn't remember doing lots and lots of TV, but when I first became a poet, I did lots and lots of TV because I was good, you know, I could perform and, and I was doing zippy, fast, funny stuff. And so I did lots of stuff for the BBC and lots of stuff for ITV and indie channels. And my mum used to collect them on, on, um, on video and just like, you know, like Martin like that. And then sometime towards the end of her life, she gave me these loads of video cassettes and I, I just didn't watch them. Um, and but then Paul Wilkinson, who has been in touch with us, who used to run the website, got them. We had to spend a weekend, and he and he digitalized digitized them, and he sent me a bunch of CDs. So when, sorry, DVDs with these clips on, I had no idea I'd been on t on television that much. I'd just forgotten it. I mean, I know you would think you you wouldn't forget it, but it's easy to do a lot of television and forget about it, when especially when you're on the run all the mm -hmm. time, and. James Sharp, the director of the film, Jangly Man film, said, have you got any TV stuff left? And I said, oh, yeah, Paul, Paul shot a lot of this stuff. This, and it's all on D and We went through his DVDs and we were still there half, you know, an, half an afternoon later going, bloody hell, I remember shooting that now. You know, and it was things. So he's used some of that. I haven't seen the film yet, mm. but he's only got something like an hour and a half. It was going to be a 20 minute documentary for captured tracks. It turned out into a being a feature feature length film. And he's got all American people. Cause I didn't know I was that well known in America. Ah. And they kind of did. 
because mm. I haven't been to America. I've been to all unusual places like the Falkland Islands and Iceland and and Japan. In, in fact, a load of islands I've been to. I kind of just didn't get around to America. Yeah. You no. know, I don't, I, don't, I don't actually like traveling very much. No, I know what you mean. But you stuff like... It was one that gets older as well. The Falklands had to be done, though, because, um, you know, my dad was in the army and they weren't going to get anyone else to go out there. So Jim Davidson did it. And I know Billy Bragg went out there. And I thought, yeah, I'll go out there. And I did a couple of gigs and I, and I reported on it. I did a 3,000 word article for the... Sunday Express about it, about oh, what the Falklands today. Right. Yeah. And yeah. I met the guy who the, who they made tumble down about as well. Uh, um, Lo, uh, Lawrence, Robert Lawrence, MC as well. I flew out with him. Uh, oh. But we were on a military flight. So for that purpose of that, uh, you know, I went out from Bryce Norton and I was military personnel for the same, for that, which, you know, which, which just meant being shouted at a bit more than usually. When when and my, I was brought up with that with my dad anyway, so I'm just thought, oh, I recognise this hands behind back and listen, you know, just shoulders back, stomach in, hands behind back and listen to what the sergeant's saying. So, we, so I was standing on ascension, being briefed about the sunburn by the sergeant. All right, they're just soldiers, nice guys. Excellent. Unless of course you're on the other incredible. side. Unless of course you're the enemy. <laughs> in which case no such happy turn of events will transpire <laughs> <laughs> okay i don't know Martin, what do you want to, do you fancy i mean I'm, I'm not you know it's up to you you might not add something ready but do, do, is it i have but, but well, how long have i got because i don't well, want to crash into anyone's well shit. we you know we're coming up to half past three but i mean you know Reiki. i know the time has flown and I'm okay thank yes, you I... to all the, thank you to all um you know the people who've who've sent questions. I've tried to cover as much as I can. I'll do it. this. Um, I'll do this poem about John Lennon. Brilliant. Because he would be 80 now, wouldn't he? He would have been 80 last November. So. The memories stay in black and white. They sparkle in the northern night and jangle from the cellar bars, the amplifiers and guitars of laughing boys who jump from cars and pelt down grey and dingy streets to be interned in hotel suites. Think a cynic, pin-up, clown. Four pipers come to Hamlin Town, so high up they daren't look down. In black and white, we'd see that scene, the luckiest kids they'd ever been. Woolworth snake belt kids like me, 10 years old in 63, from Love Me Do to Let It Be, head glued to the radio, mad, deaf to teachers, mum and dad, until their constant battering on drove me out and I was gone with Paul and Ringo, George and John. And all of it in monochrome, this group they'd started back at home, its resolution sharp and clear. Exactly how those snaps appear in 1964 that year in retrospect, it, it won't seem long till starting over one last song and then the voice, a half turn back, Mr. Lennon, the attack, black and white and black and black. It seems irrelevant somehow to ask what he'd be doing now. Lennon, had he lived that night when New York streets and candlelight still flicker back in black and white. To say his murder ended youth for some of us is not the truth. It, it can't be nailed in one glib phrase, but works in more insidious ways and in the curdling of our days. Thank you very much for bearing with me, um, audience. And uh, I hope the rest of the Winterfest goes great. And and and, and thanks for, for Jermon and Mike, who's helped to steward this ball of chaos through it. Thank no, you so thank much. Thank you, Martin. That's great. And, and what an insight into the range of work there as well, Martin. So, you know, that you've done. So thank you very much. And um, thank you. <laughs> All right. Brilliant. Welcome to Winterfest, the music and arts festival where we're banishing the winter blues. Proceeds from the festival go to the Winterfest Wellbeing Fund, supporting local people and Mid and Northeast Essex Mind. Featuring 22 events, check our website, brightlingseawinterfest.co.uk, for full details. And please, make a donation via our PayPal link. Winterfest.